next speaker is the creator of Signal, and he is going to tell you what he's uh, doing right now. So the next talk is the ecosystem is moving challenges for distributed and decentralized technology by Moxie Marlin Spike. Have fun. Hello. All right, so these uh, three kids are playing around, and they uh, break into the barn of a farmer. And they're playing around in the barn, and the farmer um, hears something in the barn, and he comes out uh, to investigate. <coughs> so the three kids have to hide. And they see these uh, three empty potato sacks in the barn. So they all jump in the potato sacks. But as the farmer comes in, they're still kind of like moving around a little bit. And so the farmer you know, is investing in this situation, and he starts walking towards one of the potato sacks. And uh, the kid inside sees what's happening. And so he says, meow. And you know, the farmer's like, oh, there's a cat in there, OK. You know? And so he starts looking at the other potato sack. And you know, the kid inside sees what's going on. And so he's like, woof. And so the farmer's like, oh, OK, there's like a dog in there. Uh, and so you know, the farmer starts looking at the third potato sack. And as he gets closer, the kid inside says, potatoes. All right. I'm like the potato kid right now. I, all those people who got like six hours of sleep last night, you're doing better than me. I'm at like 7%, you know. Jet lag is a crazy thing. I fell asleep at like six last night. I uh, just couldn't stay up any later. And you know, I was like hard asleep. I, you know, I felt like I sleep forever. And so I woke up, and I was like, wow, I slept for a long time. And I looked at my phone, and it said um, 7.15. So I was like, oh, wow, I like, slept all night. This is great. You know? like, I'm waking up at 7.15 in the morning. So I like, got up. I'm like, brushing my teeth and shit. You know? And eventually, I realized it's 7.15 at night still. I slept for an hour and 15 minutes. You know? um, OK, so uh, <coughs> my name is Moxie. Uh, I work on a messaging app called Signal. Uh, Signal is a private messaging app. Uh, but it is not decentralized, which is to say that there's no like federated mesh P2P blockchain something something. Um, but every now and then, people are like, there should be a federated mesh P2P blockchain something something. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about decentralized systems um, from the perspective of the time I've spent at Signal and the work that I've done there, and um, you know uh, what we're trying to accomplish. So I, I think. You know, at a high level, I should say that you know, while I work in software, I greatly envy musicians, writers, filmmakers, painters. Uh, these are all people who create things and can really be finished forever. You can record an album today, and 20 years later, you can listen to that album and appreciate it just the same. But software is never finished. Uh, you cannot write a piece of software uh, today, like write an app, and then 20 years later, just you know, enjoy that app in the same way. Because software is part of an ecosystem, and the ecosystem is moving. Uh, the platform changes out from under it. Networks evolve. Security threats are in constant flux. The UX language that we've all learned to speak and understand together really sits still. And as more money, time, and focus has gone into this entire ecosystem, the faster the whole thing has begun to travel. The world is now filled with rooms that look like these in buildings that look like these that are packed to the rafters with people who sit in front of a computer for eight hours a day every single day. And all of the energy and the momentum behind that means that user expectations are evolving rapidly. And evolving rapidly is in contradiction with decentralization. How is that possible? What does that mean? After all, the internet is decentralized. That seems like a dynamic, evolving, rapidly kind of uh, place. Uh, but when you really look at it, like the fundamentals of the internet, um, that's not always the case. And for instance, if you look at like IP, you know, one of the fundamental protocols of the internet, how, do we get, you know, how have we done with that? Well, we got to the first production version of IP, and we've been trying for 20 years to get to the second production version uh, without a lot of success. Um, you know, HTTP, OK, we got to version 1.1 1 .1 in 1997. 
and we've been basically stuck there until now. Uh, SMTP, IRC, XMPP, DNS, it's all the same. They're all frozen in time, uh, circa the sort of early 1990s. Uh, because once you decentralize a protocol, it becomes extremely difficult to change. Uh, you put it out there in the world, there's like many different uh, clients, different implementations, uh, different deployments, uh, and so making any changes becomes extremely difficult. Uh, meanwhile, centralizing protocols has been like a recipe for success. You know, it's what Slack did with IRC, it's what Facebook did with email, it's what WhatsApp did with XMPP. In each case, the decentralized protocol is stuck in time, um, but the people who have centralized them have been able to just iterate super quickly and develop these products that are extremely compelling to people. Um, so the fact that something like email is decentralized is cool in the sense that I host my own email. I have since 1996. I wouldn't really wish it upon anybody, um, uh, but I still do it. Um, but the fact that email is decentralized is also what means that my email is not encrypted uh, and never will be uh, because it's, it's too difficult to change at this point. It's, it's out there in the world and, and making that change is probably not going to happen. Um, you know, by contrast, uh, WhatsApp is centralized, uh, so I don't like run my own WhatsApp server. I don't have my own, you know, WhatsApp uh, data store or whatever. Um, but it's end-to-end -end encrypted for billions of people by, def by default, and they were able to just you know roll that out with a software update. Um, so I think this is the, sort of the fundamental problem that we have to deal with, right? Which is so long as decentralization means stasis, while centralization means movement that decentralized environments are going to have a lot of trouble competing with centralized environments. But you know, why do we want decentralization anyway? You know, like, uh, people talk about decentralization a lot, but what is it that we're actually after? I think um, when you sort of break it down, the partisans of decentralization are advocating for you know, increased privacy, censorship resistance, availability, and control. These are the things that I think people who are into decentralization are really kind of looking for um, and, and hope to get out of that world. So let's look at these in turn, because these are things that I'm interested in as well, um, and that I would like you know, uh, an app-like signal to provide. So you know, privacy. Um, we've already seen that decentralized uh, systems are not inherently encrypted. In fact, uh, most decentralized systems in the world are not end-to-end uh, -end encrypted uh, by default. Um, and there's nothing about decentralization that makes uh, the things encrypted. You know? um, and so um, I think advocates of decentralization uh, have a different take on privacy, which is one of data ownership. Uh, the idea that like, you can um, you know, run a service yourself and that you maintain ownership of that data. And those people um, you know, also point out that that includes metadata, uh, not just you know, uh, the contents of things like messages or something, but also the metadata about them. Um, and that, so in a sense, that, you know, that is better than just um, some kind of encryption solution. Um, but in a lot of ways, I feel like this is uh, somewhat of an antiquated notion that is left over from a time when computers were for computer people. Um, you know, this, you know, I think in the, in the 1990s, um, the sort of general thesis uh, for people working in this space was let's develop really powerful tools for ourselves and then teach everybody to be like us. Um, and that's not really how the world developed. Um, you know, at the time, we sort of imagined that the internet would look like this, uh, that not only would everyone on the internet be both a producer and consumer of content, but also a producer and consumer of infrastructure. Um, and neither of those things really uh, bore out. Uh, in reality, the internet looks a lot more like this, you know, that uh, things sort of seem to naturally uh, roll up and converge into these like super nodes um, that people are making use of, that people aren't all producers and consumers of content or infrastructure. Um, so, you know, given that world, while I host my own email, you know, since the world looks like this, I don't actually have any meaningful data ownership, even though I run my own mail server. I don't actually have any kind of metadata protection or anything like that, because every email that I send or receive has Gmail on the other end of it. Even though I host my own mail server, I might as well just be a Gmail customer, because they have a copy of basically every email that I ever send or receive. Um, so given that I think that the world has developed in this direction, 
I, I feel like real data protection is more likely to come from things like end-to-end -end encryption than it is from um, data ownership. And that things like metadata protection are going to require new techniques, um, and that those new techniques are more likely to evolve in centralized rather than decentralized environments, because uh, centralized environments are where things tend to change. Um, so for instance, you know, at Signal, this is uh, an area that we've been working on a lot. Um, so at Signal, you know, we have technologies like uh, private groups, uh, private contact discovery, sealed sender. Um, these are things that um, mean that you know, the Signal service has no visibility into uh, group communication or even group uh, uh, state or group uh, membership information, um, no visibility into uh, your you know, contacts or even your social graph, um, and uh, uh, no visibility into who is messaging whom. Um, so you know, looking at something like private groups, uh, the way that group state is usually maintained is you know, on a server you have a database, and in that database you have uh, a record for every group. And you know, the group needs to contain information like, you know, what's the group title, what's the group avatar, you know, what's the membership, you know, who's in this group, what are their roles, maybe someone's an administrator, or someone, maybe someone's a group creator, maybe someone's like a read-only group member. Um, and then, you know, maybe some group attributes like a pinned message or something like that. Uh, and, you know, you know, clients can query this database in order to render uh, group information for um, uh, the user. And you know, given that um, it seems unlikely that we're going to move into a world where everyone is like, running their own servers uh, in addition to their own clients, that um, just merely like, you know, putting this plain text database in the, in the, uh, you know, on everyone's individual servers is sort of uh, unlikely. Um, so you know, one thing you might think about doing is just encrypting it, right? Where you could just have this uh, server-side database, and in the database, um, all of the, the entries are encrypted with a key that is shared amongst group members, but that the server doesn't have any visibility into. Um, and so you know, that seems like a straightforward solution. The problem is that um, you also need the server to be able to enforce uh, access control and basic rules. Right? Like the server should be able to look at the members of a group and uh, determine whether you know, a group member is authorized to make changes, like to change the title or to add another member to a group or to kick someone out of the group or anything like that. Uh, but if the data is encrypted, then how is the server going to do that? Um, so at Signal, we, we developed an a anonymous credential scheme uh, that allows uh, the server to store uh, encrypted membership lists. So uh, the server has a, you know, a record for some random group of um, its members, but each you know, member is in, encrypted, so the, the server doesn't know who the members of the group are. And then, you know, let's say Alice wants to add someone to a group. Alice can construct a zero-knowledge proof and um, authenticate to the server, proving that she has a um, assigned credential that matches the encrypted contents of one of the group, uh, one of the group members, but without ever actually revealing uh, what the contents of, the, of that record are or who she is. Um, and then, you know, once authenticated, Alice could, you know, add another member to the group, like Frank. And then, you know, once Frank gets added to the group, he can come along and do the same thing, where he constructs a zero knowledge proof and is able to prove in zero knowledge without revealing uh, who he is or or the contents of this record uh, to the server that he is a group member. And he might request the membership list. The server, you know, transmits the encrypted values to him. Then he can decrypt them locally with the the key that's shared amongst group members and determine who is in the group and display that to the user. Um, you know, so this is an example of uh, some you know, new cryptography that we um, developed uh, in order to solve this problem. And you know, it's, again, like a new technique in order to, uh, to uh, offer some privacy-preserving uh, technology uh, in the space that I think is you know, more likely to happen in places where we can just make these changes and, and roll them out super easily. Um, all of this adds up to you know, a world where I can publish the um, server-side state for my Signal account. Um, there's nothing in it, really. Um, you know, even the profile data is encrypted. Uh, the only you know, real um, unencrypted values here are the last seen time in, in uh, day-level precision uh, that I connected to the Signal service and, and when my account was created. 
Uh, there's no group information about like, you know, what groups I'm in, uh, the titles of those groups, the avatars of those groups, who, who the other group members are. Uh, my contacts you know, aren't stored there. Uh, my social graph isn't uh, on the service. My, even my profile data uh, isn't vis uh, visible to the, the service. And you know, when people message me or I message people, uh, the server doesn't have visibility to that. Uh, meanwhile, my email still isn't even end-to-end -end encrypted uh, and never will be. But even if we did live in this world where um, you know, uh, the internet looks differently and everyone is both a producer and consumer of infrastructure, um, this uh, P2P, uh, P2P world is not necessarily privacy preserving in itself. Uh, for instance, when we first rolled out uh, voice and video calling in, in Signal, um, we designed it so that it did establish uh, PDP connections between um, the, both parties of a call. So you know, if I call somebody, um, I would establish a, a, a direct connection to that device. But uh, when we deployed that, people were like, wait a second, wait a second. Like, does that mean that someone could just call me and learn my IP address? I, I don't want that. You know? What about all the metadata here that like, uh, you know, my ISP or um, you know, someone on Wi-Fi or whatever uh, on, on the same network as me can see who I'm calling and who's calling me. Like, that's not what I want. Uh, isn't there anything you guys can do about this? And yeah, we can just, you know, route it through a server instead. Um, and so that's what we do in many cases. So, uh, you know, you know, thinking about privacy, I, I uh, kind of feel like that um, decentralized systems aren't uh, inherently going to give us the privacy properties that we necessarily desire. Uh, and that it's more likely that we can develop uh, technology to you know, offer what it is that uh, people want in centralized environments. Uh, thinking about censorship resistance, um, this is uh, another area where I feel like the, the idea uh, of censorship resistance for decentralized environments is that many things are somehow more difficult to block than one thing. That if you have like many servers, that it's harder for a sensor to block access to those than it is to block access to one server. Uh, and again, I feel like this is sort of like an antiquated notion left over from a different time that in today's world, if something is user discoverable, that it's also going to be sensor discoverable in a lot of ways. Uh, but the basic idea is that like, if you're such and such at something.com and something.com gets blocked, you could just switch to something else at something else.com, you know, and you can just sort of keep moving around like that. Um, the problem is that every time you do that, you blow up your entire social graph. Um, so, you know, if you imagine a scenario where there's a bunch of different, you know, users who, um, you know, are affiliated with a bunch of different servers, uh, that if, you know, one server gets blocked by a sensor, that the users who can no longer access that server can switch to uh, different servers. Um, but the problem is that as soon as they do that, uh, they have to be rediscovered by everyone else in the network uh, because now they have a different address. Um, and it's more likely that if you know, one server is blocked at any given moment that you know, all servers are going to be blocked in that moment and everyone has to switch to like, a whole other thing. And at that point, you've like, really blown up uh, you know, your entire social network. Everyone has to rediscover everyone from the beginning. You're basically playing a game of whack-a-mole that's, that's very asymmetric because every day that uh, you know, sensors take an action to block known servers is basically like the first day of your entire social network. You're, you're starting over from scratch uh, where everyone has to rediscover each other all over again. Um, so you know, to the extent that if your strategy is sort of like bouncing around, it's actually, I think, more effective to just have one centralized service with multiple ingress points. So you know, if you have a service and there's a bunch of users who are using that service, uh, that if access to that server gets blocked, to just you know, spin up another uh, ingress point, you know, a proxy or even you know, a VPN or something like that that everyone can switch to. At the moment that people switch, they're, you know, it's the same kind of thing where it's like the switching strategy, but you're not blowing up your social network. Everyone has the same uh, address and can be identified. If that gets blocked, you, know, you switch to another one, et cetera, et cetera. So, you're playing a game of whack-a-mole, but it's not as asymmetric uh, because um, you know, the, the switching cost is very low. Uh, this is the a kind of strategy that apps like WhatsApp and Signal have used to resist censorship attempts in um, uh, most times that, 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 that they've been attempted. Uh, so you know, they'll use strategies like uh, domain fronting, um, which uh, basically uh, you know, when clients um, uh, is a, uh, a technique where like a client connects to um, a CDN that's uh, operated by uh, some large CDN provider and you know, does a DNS and uh, SNI uh, TLS connection with one host, like you know, some 
large service like Google Maps or something like that. But then the HTTP host header includes um, or specifies a, a different address, which is like you know a proxy. Uh, and so in order to block this, like the sensor has to block access to you know, uh, some larger set of services rather than just uh, one specific service. Uh, or um, using techniques like proxy sharding, which is basically like you set up multiple ingress points um, and you shard access to them uh, to different users. So um, you know, only some users can discover some access points, which means that a sensor can't discover all of the access points. Um, very quickly, and then as things get blocked, you you know keep shuffling around. Um, these are the kind of things that require uh, moving quickly. Uh, that like you know as uh, people are trying to block access to a service, that you're moving very quickly to respond. Uh, and again, moving quickly is uh, not necessarily something that is uh, easy in decentralized environments. Uh, so again, when it comes to censorship resistance, I feel like. Um, you're sort of more likely to see effective censorship resistance in centralized environments rather than these decentralized environments. And in many cases, that's what we've actually seen. Um, and then you know, availability. So um, every time there's like an outage, uh, people are like, you should decentralize. You, know? um, you, know, you wouldn't have as many outages. But I think uh, the reality is that you would just have more outages. Uh, you know, like you, uh, it's you know, if you th think about it in terms of like if you have a centralized service and you wanted to uh, move that centralized service into two different data centers, and the way you did that was by splitting the data up between those two di different data centers, you just have your availability um, because the mean time between failure goes up since you have two different data centers, uh, which means that it's more likely that there's going to be an outage in one of those data centers at any given moment. And since you've uh, split your data between them, uh, you have the availability of that data. Uh, so again, I don't think availability is uh, necessarily something that you're more likely to see um, a better availability in de decentralized rather than centralized environments. Um, and then finally, um, control. Uh, so I think this is a, a really interesting moment. Um, the current sort of sentiment in, in the world today uh, has changed a lot. Uh, now people sort of feel that the internet is this uh, terrible place in ways that uh, I don't think people used to feel. That the era of uh, utopianism and um, this uh, vision for you know, technology providing a better and brighter future is uh, coming to an end. Um, and I think a lot of that comes down to a feeling uh, that we have a, a lack of control, that uh, technology is not actually serving our needs uh, in the way that we want it to, and that uh, we don't have any control over or agency over how that uh, is manifest. And so um, I think you know, the strategies that partisans of decentralized environments have uh, for manifesting that control is you know, either through this like, switching idea, basically, so that it's like if you have a federated environment, that different services could behave differently, um, so that um, you know, if you uh, were uh, a subscriber of one service and your provider uh, started to behave in a way that you felt was inappropriate, that you could just switch to a different provider um, but not lose access to the entire network. Uh, which, you know, I think has a certain appeal, but, you know, if that is true, if that is, uh, you know, a strategy worth pursuing, I think we have to ask ourselves, why do people still use Yahoo Mail? Uh, you know, it uh, hasn't been updated in like 10 years. Uh, they had like, you know, a massive series of uh, security incidents. Um, it's not clear who even owns it anymore. Um, but uh, people are still using Yahoo Mail. Like a lot of people are still using Yahoo Mail. Uh, why? Because changing email is hard. Um, and I think we're, it's sort of this interesting moment where, uh, you know, switching from Yahoo to Gmail is actually harder than switching from WhatsApp to Telegram to Signal. Uh, because again, every time uh, you switch email providers, you basically blown up your social network. Everyone has to rediscover your new federated identifier. And then if you use a non-federated identifier, like a phone number, um, as the basis for your social network, that you know, switching between um, uh, you know, different services that aren't actually connected with each other is, is, is actually easier than switching between federated services. And the sort of notifications on your device or your desktop becomes like the federating bridge um, between those networks in a way that is, uh, in, in, in some senses, uh, more effective than uh, the federated models ever were. Um, the other uh, sort of 
um, strategy, I think, for uh, maintaining or regaining control uh, from decentralized environments is um, extensibility. Uh, so this is the idea that what we can do is develop a protocol um, that uh, is designed to be extended so that um, different people can um, modify this technology in ways that you know, uh, it feels like meet their needs. Um, and I think you know, the best uh, or the b most well-known example of this is a, a protocol like XMPP, uh, which was a chat protocol de designed to be extensible. But you know, in the end, what we ended up, was, ended up with was this, this like, morass of ZEPs, uh, which were the extensions. Um, and uh, there wasn't ever like, a feeling of strong consistency, which generated a lot of uh, uncertainty amongst, uh, within the user experience. Right? So you know, even today, it's like, you want to send a video over XMPP? Like, uh, you know, it's like, there's a ZEP for that. Like, does the recipient uh, support that? Uh, we don't know. You want to send a GIF? Like, you know, it's, that's a little dicey. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm sure, you know, and uh, none of the uh, extensibility that was built into the protocol uh, could actually adapt to, um, you know, major changes that needed to be addressed, like, um, you know, adapting to mobile environments. Um, so I, I feel like in the end, like, the whole extensibility thing didn't really provide uh, the control that people wanted because those zaps were... Uh, of little value until they were adopted everywhere, um, uh, which is hard to do. And then, you know, even in distribu uh, like pseudo distributed uh, kind of uh, models like Bitcoin, um, I think that the control that people have, it's sort of interesting that the control that people are seeking has manifested uh, in the form of forks. You know, so that when there's a disagreement, um, uh, people just, you know, start a new network, you know, like, uh, you know, Bitcoin Cash or, you know, uh, various altcoins um, that, you know, people take like the existing code base and just you know, start a different service. Um, you know, ultimately, I think that has led to like a lot of confusion uh, in terms of, uh, you know, users that are engaging with these networks. But um, to the extent that uh, people are uh, manifesting the control that they would like to see, um, it, it's interesting to, to me that it doesn't seem to have uh, much to do with the decentralized nature of these protocols, that it has more to do with the open source uh, nature of these projects. Uh, that because these projects are open source, it's very easy for uh, people to take uh, what's there and just change it and you know, redeploy it as something else. Um, so in a sense, I feel like that you know, open source is sort of the, the best tool that we have in terms of manifesting um, control. Uh, but even that, I think, is like... Um, it's like a difficult ask because um, if you know what we want is for technology to, to better serve us, uh, I think we have the, the larger problem in my mind is that if what it takes, if what technology demands is rooms that look like this and buildings that look like this, full of people sitting in front of a computer for eight hours a day every day forever, that um, it's unlikely that we're going to see technology meeting our needs in the way that we want it to. You know, all the time people, you know, have these ideas where they're like, well, what if there was like Uber, but it was decentralized? So that like, you know, the money goes to the drivers, you know, wouldn't that be cool? I think that would be cool. But if what it takes to build that is rooms that look like this and buildings that look like this with people who sit in front of a computer for eight hours a day, every day, forever, guess where the money is going to go? It's going to go to those places, you know. Um, so I think if we're serious about like, you know, changing technology so that it better serves us, to me, the, the best thing that we can do to make that happen is to make technology easier, to make the deployment and development of technology easier. And again, decentralized systems uh, are not the first thing that like pop into my mind when I think of easy. Uh, you know, in a lot of ways, I feel like you know, decentralized systems uh, make everything harder in a world where we should be trying to make things easier for people uh, to deploy. Uh, so you know, on the whole, I feel like you know, these are the challenges for decentralized systems that, uh, in a lot of ways, I think that they're, uh, you know, we need to like, reimagine how it is that we're thinking about uh, technology, given the, the direction that the world has gone, uh, and that we can, you know, find the solutions to these problems and the things that we're looking for um, 
in ways that are, are perhaps more effective than uh, building decentralized systems. So I'm not entirely optimistic uh, about the, the future of decentralized systems, but I would also love to be proven wrong. Um, however, I feel like anyone who's working on decentralized systems today uh, needs to do so uh, without forgetting that the ecosystem is moving. Um, in, in the words of Marx, uh, we can create our own history, but only under circumstances that are directly transmitted from the past. Thank you. All right. Uh, you can see eight microphones in that hall, and also we take questions from the internet. So if you have a question, please line up on the microphones. And the first question goes to the internet, please. Twitter wants to know if you can comment anything about post-quantum security. So for example, there was a thesis uh, by Ines Duit at University of Twente about the post-quantum signal protocol. Uh, question from the internet? Okay. Um, yeah, I, don't, I, I haven't seen this, uh, this thesis, uh, so I can't really say anything about it. Um, but you know, the way that things are sort of uh, headed is, is um, you know, people are trying to develop post-quantum um, crypto, post-quantum key exchanges and stuff like that. Um, the situation today is that like, as we develop those things, you know, we're develop or as people develop those things, um, you know, we're trying to develop uh, increasing confidence in those algorithms. Uh, there's also a little bit of uncertainty about like, whether those are like, pre-quantum resistance in, in some ways, just because uh, things are so new. So the way that things are going is you know, people are trying to like, take a new post-quantum key exchange stuff uh, and mix them into um, you know, pre-quantum uh, key exchange stuff so that uh, it's like an additive security property so that uh, if those things th turned out to you know, have problems even in the pre-quantum world, that you're not uh, shooting yourself in the foot. So that's sort of the direction that things are going, and you know, we'll probably start looking at that uh, more as those things mature. OK. As we have a lot of questions, please keep your questions short. First question to microphone number four. Hi. Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering, in all this uh, overview, how you perceive the efforts in, on the standard of messaging layer security of providing this base layer of end-to-end -end encrypted communication, which is, uh, to my knowledge, decentralized in, in its thoughts. Um, yeah, OK, so uh, I think um, you know, we're not actually a part of the, the MLS process. Uh, and MLS is like focusing on one uh, specific um, scenario, which is um, a specific scenario within uh, just the group messaging. Um, I think you know there. That's like a whole other conversation. Uh, that I think you know that there's a, a lot of challenges there that uh, uh, they may not be thinking through. Um, but I think that the. I mean, what's interesting is that uh, it is a sort of unique scenario, and that it's like a standards process uh, amongst uh, you know a number of entities that don't actually communicate with each other. Uh, so it's not um, it's not entirely clear what having a standard. The, the value of having a standard is, since there's no real plan for these ent entities to like federate or, you know, have some uh, merging of their networks, um, other than just uh, you know agreeing on a, 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 like a set of principles for cryptography that everyone feels like are you know a solid thing to adopt. Okay, thank you. One question for microphone number one, please. Um, hi. Uh, thanks for the thought-provoking talk. Uh, you said so many things I disagree with. It's tough to pick a question, but uh, the. Um, <laughs> Uh, one I'm going to ask is uh, the, the features you have about um, uh, private groups and sealed sender, uh, those seem to be protecting data at rest uh, for when the server is compromised, uh, the data that's on it is uh, less useful to the uh, attacker. But uh, if the server is already compromised, it's not really providing a traffic analysis protection. Uh, your, your metadata protection is effectively a, a pinky promise oriented architecture and you've outsourced the keeping of the promise to a defense contractor owned by the richest man in the world. And so my question is, um, how confident are you that Amazon is keeping the promises that you're making? Well, I mean, the, you know, the, the purpose of uh, projects like Signal is to um, get to a place where it doesn't matter, you know, like where something is hosted or whatever, you know. Um, and so, you know, you point out that you know what we're talking about here is stored data, um, and you know, it's like in attacking this, this, uh, you know, in, in attacking this. Uh, problem, uh, you know, I think you have to, you know, start from one place and, and you know, work until you end up uh, where you want to be. 
And you know, right now, uh, like, you know, the worst thing that you can have is data in a database. You know, because like, uh, what, uh, you know, what tends to happen on the internet now is like when there's data on a database that it just becomes public. Uh, that there's like a lot of data dumps out in the world. So like, that's the worst uh, possible scenario. Uh, and you know, by design, uh, you know, most systems are set up so that the, in order to function, they need to have data in a database that is at great risk, I think, of you know, ending, out, ending up you know, public out in the world. Um, and so you know, the first thing you want to do is design your system so that you don't have to have data in a database. Uh, and so you know, then you know, you know, what you're talking about is like, you know, traffic analysis and you know, things like that that you know, people can you know, look at uh, traffic flows in order to figure out um, other like you know metadata properties. Um, you know, there's things that users themselves can do today to uh, help with that. You know, they can use Tor, or they can use like VPNs or whatever like that. Uh, in um, you know using these systems, and then that's also where we eventually want to go is to like you know to keep working up the stack in order to uh, you know have something that is fully comprehensive. All right, we take another question from the internet, please. IRC wants to know what do you think of peer-to-peer peer -peer solutions that also hide participants' email uh, IP addresses? Sorry, um, for example, by exposing them only through rendezvous points like Tor nodes. Um, uh, yeah, I mean that that could be cool. I mean, I think uh, you know the challenge is uh, developing you know the challenge is developing a system like that that is actually scalable um, that uh, you know uh, you know large number of people large numbers of people can use. Uh, and that accounts for the fact that the ecosystem is moving, that you can develop a decentralized thing um, that you're able to uh, iterate on quickly. And so I think that is, you know, in developing decentralized systems, I feel like that is the most important question for me, just in terms of, you know, the time that I've spent in the space and, and the, the work that I've done there, um, that I'm, like, much more interested in, like, unique uh, approaches to solving that problem uh, than I am like the specifics of you know IP address hiding with Tor nodes or something like that. Okay, another question from microphone number eight, please. Apart from the U.S. government, what countries have you received data requests from, and how did you respond? Um, I don't. Uh, we've never. The, uh, the only response that we've ever issued to um, uh, you know any subpoena or like governmental request. Uh, is you know on our website we have a, a section where we post all of the you know requests that we respond to. I think it's signal.org/bigbrother, um, and so the, the, it's only one request that we've ever uh, responded to. Uh, okay, one more question from microphone number three at the end, please. Hi. Um, Signal has a very big reputation as being good and secure communication tool for activists. This is also being pushed in the Global South. Um, I have the honor to work with some Global South organizations. They are very suspicious of the Signal, especially due to the fact that you have to provide a phone number. So your location can be tracked and all sorts of other problems that everyone here is fully aware of. Uh, I would like to know well, why? Why is that even still a thing for Signal to sure. provide, to make people provide phone numbers yeah. while still being hyped as a secure tool for activists? I think this contradiction is the important person. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great question. It's, um, it's a, a really complicated question. So, um, so you know, any uh, any social network needs any social app needs a social network. So uh, Signal is a social app, and it needs a social network. Um, and so the social network that we've chosen to use is the network that exists um, on your device already, that's user owned, uh, that's portable, the address book on your phone. Um, and so there's a lot of cool things about that. You know, if that's your social network, it it empowers the users in a lot of ways because. Um, you can move that network with you uh, as you go from service to service. Like as I pointed out, you know, moving from WhatsApp to Telegram to Signal is, is easier than switching from Yahoo Mail to, to Gmail for that reason. Um, on the other hand, there are a lot of people who don't want to, um, they don't want uh, to be a part of a, a, a portable network. You know, that they want to, uh, you know, be, they want to use Signal in a way where like people can't figure out how to contact them through other means. Um, for, uh, for legitimate reasons. Uh, the challenge is that if you're building your so own social network, you, you need to store it somewhere. Um, well, I think there's two challenges. One is that uh, if you're building your own social network, you need to store it somewhere. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, for instance, like, you know, there, there are uh, apps that have successfully built their own social network. If you, you know, look at an app like Snapchat or something like that, you know, you can create a username and most people associate it with a phone number, but you don't have to. Um, but, you know, you'll notice that, like, if you uninstall Snapchat and you reinstall it, your social network is still there. Where was it all of that time, you know? Uh, if you drop your phone in the toilet and you, you know, install Snapchat, you still have your social network. Where was it? It was on Snapchat server, right? Uh, they have uh, a full copy of your uh, entire social network, your social graph, et cetera, et cetera. So that, um, you know, so the challenge for us, because uh, this is, you know, uh, something that we would like to provide, is that um, if we have this alternate social network, we would need some way to make that persistent. Uh, that it's bad enough that right now when you, uh, you know, lose your phone and reinstall Signal, you lose all of your message data because it only exists on your phone. But it would be even worse if you lose your entire social graph at that moment as well, and that you have to rediscover what everyone's identifiers are. Um, and at the same time, we don't want to just store uh, you know, your social graph in plain text so that we have access to uh, that entire social graph and that if Signal is compromised, um, you know, that whoever compromises Signal also has access to your entire social graph. Uh, and so you know, the challenge is in developing something that's actually privacy preserving that allows us to you know, maintain the social graph over time. Uh, so we recently uh, you know, uh, published a technology preview of uh, something that we call secure value recovery that is basically the first step in order to solve this problem. The other challenge, though, is that um, it depends on what you mean by not provide your phone number. Uh, because you know, there are uh, plenty of applications that you can use where uh, you like, use some alternate identifier that isn't uh, necessarily associated with phone number. Um, but the sort of unfortunate reality is that you know, in all of those cases, your client needs to provide to the server either an FCM or APN identifier, which is used to send push notifications to your device. Um, and that uh, is, does uniquely identify your device in, in ways that could probably use, be used to identify your, whatever your phone number is. Uh, so it sort of depends on what your, your, your threat model is there. But. Okay, thank you very much. I know there are a lot of more questions, but unfortunately time is over. If you want to, the speaker will be around later on. You can gather up here, but the talk is now done. So give a huge round of applause for Moxie Marlin Spike.